Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, the show where we dig deep into the insights of some of the leading policymakers and business people in the Middle East and indeed the world. I'm Frank Kane. Today I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by Ahmed bin Sulayem, Executive Chairman of the Dubai Multi Commodity Center. The DMCC can lay fair claim to be the most successful of the commercial free zones in the Emirates, trading in everything from gold and diamonds through coffee and tea and now cryptocurrencies. Mr. Bin Salayam, welcome to Frankly Speaking. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. Nice to see you again. Let me go to a hot issue of the day. The big news recently from the UAE was the decision to uh, introduce corporation tax at a rate of 9% in 2023. Tell me, from your perspective in a free zone, how, we, how will it affect your business and how will it affect the economic competitiveness of the UAE as a low tax uh, destination? As far as DMCC is concerned, I'm not sure. Last year we registered 2,845 companies, broke the record of all of the years of DMCC since the start of registering and licensing businesses. And we've supposedly, the world has had better years than 2021 and uh, we've excelled then. Uh, when I look at the, uh, the news, it's, uh, it's a tax on profits. The feedback I've had, I've, I've, I've engaged with a few members and all that, it's not applicable to the free zones. Um, some businesses that, whose focus is domestic may, uh, I, think, I think, seize the value and stay, sticking around if it makes business sense. One thing I do know for sure is that the taxes in the UAE are less than Ireland, and Ireland's been a nice place for Apple, from what I read. Mm, for sure, yeah. So, uh, but why do you think they've done this? Why was it introduced? It's part of the UAE's development, their infrastructure projects. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've, uh, we're the first Arab country to host the Expo. Um, expect more initiatives. Not everything's announced, but I do believe uh, the, the UAE, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and these cities are looking to provide a lot more than what we've seen today. This, I, knowing our leaders, this is not even halfway. There's a lot more they want to bring. They're doing. They're uh, likely focused on the second, third, and fourth generations to come. Let me ask you something uh, which has been quite controversial of late: uh, gold, which I know has been a big factor in in the DMCC's uh, success story. Uh, but it's also led recently to allegations about uh, trading irregularities, especially in Africa, uh, which threatens to impact the UAE's global reputation, it seems to me. Tell me, how has this situation arisen? You know, what's your narrative on this? Well, there was a, a letter that conveniently uh, landed at Bloomberg's from uh, CECO from Switzerland, and I've addressed that uh, in a blog which got covered, credit to Bloomberg, covering my, uh, my, my full response almost, and with a link to my LinkedIn uh, blog. Um, the, uh, and, I, and I clarified where UAE is positioned. Historically and even currently, I think we're, we're ahead of uh, other, other, other centers. Now, the second one that came out uh, was on the 28th, between Christmas and New Year. Just the timing of it, I knew there was something off with the piece. Um, they quoted the Minister of Mines of Nigeria, um, and I believe, I, I really think it's taken out of context. I don't think that's the full conversation. I don't think it's the same context, because the same minister is quoted uh, that they have, weak, uh, they have weak data, they're struggling to, to they have weak uh, mining institutions. I mean, bef unless these are, are uh, taken care of, I don't think uh, we can take uh, these, these statements seriously. I have also sent an invitation today uh, to the uh, Minister of Mines of Nigeria to come to DMCC, to come and visit Dubai, to see how we handle businesses. And hopefully they pick up on, our, uh, on, our, uh, um, on, on, on what Dubai has been uh, setting up. We, we're talking about just DMCC alone. We have three Operation Gold refineries. And at the end of this year, there will be two more operational gold refineries. So we're excelling. The UAE represents 25% uh, of the gold trade. There's no specific target, really, to get to capture 70 or 80. We just, we just move fast. We, uh, Dubai also re-exports 60% of tea. That's because of its uh, logistic strength, the convenience and all that. Despite uh, pressures from competing centers, 
I don't think it's really that credible, to be honest. Otherwise, it would have been posted on the 10th or 15th of January, not on the 28th when nobody's around. Not during the silly season, as yeah, they call holiday, it. Yeah, yeah. It's a holiday okay. piece. But what resolution do you uh, foresee for this? How can you, can you convince the world uh, that DMCC is, is adhering to international best practice here? Let's go back to, uh, to the concern here. Uh, we're talking about gold being smuggled out. Now, two countries in Africa have uh, taken this challenge up, uh, Ghana and Ethiopia, where they buy, buy the gold from the artisanal miners. They are buying it. Ethiopia is providing fair prices, higher prices than the market, and shipping it straight to Mittelor, to Switzerland, to have it refined. That's their solution. Ghana has a similar uh, concept as well. And for the rest of the African countries, they can learn from them. And if they can't afford to do it, then join me at the webinar for banning hand carry gold. This is the third or fourth one right now. EATA is attending it. I'm going to make sure the Gold Council attends it. And uh, I mean, if, if you can ban bottle of water from entering a flight, you can ban hand carry gold. There's no reason to encourage smuggling. So hand banning hand, hand carry, carry gold, gold would be a big part of the solution. Would gold. It? it will put a dent to it. I've had, I've had, uh, I've had. I had uh, responses like, well, they can ship it by sea. Good luck with that. It's not silver. Silver can, you can uh, maybe afford to. Plus, you risk uh, bumping into pirates on the way here. Sure. Uh, let's move on to diamonds and other precious stones, uh, which have also been, been big business for Dubai, I know. Uh, and you have fought off all sorts of efforts by competitors uh, to knock Dubai in this respect, haven't you? Well, why do so many people in the precious gems business seem to have it in for the Emirates? Well, on the jewelry side, uh, on the diamond side, I haven't heard much uh, on recent times. It used to be back in the day, 2015 and 16, that uh, the talks were rough diamonds would come here underpriced and go in with a different price. We had three workshops during the KP uh, chairmanship, which I chaired in 2016. Kim Kimberly process. Kimberly process. Right. We had three workshops on rough diamond valuation. And the, uh, the tool and the solution to, uh, to have price discovery, they know that I have it. They know the systems, yeah? It's, it's uh, based on reverse engineering from transacted polished diamonds. There are a number of companies that made, made a killing in this business. They know how to process price discovery. And it's with the KP minutes, uh, minutes as well at the UN. I don't see them bringing that up uh, much nowadays. Um, and the KP is really, it's been, uh, it's been a benchmark for other commodities. Other, I, I do see cobalt looking at uh, the, the success of the diamond industry. Um, and we haven't uh, stopped there. We have the warrant systems that the World Diamond Council has, has put up there. And coming up in a few weeks, uh, we'll be hosting uh, the World Diamond Council meeting. There's uh, the Internet Diamond Manufacturing Association also having their meetings here. We're having possibly the most important jewelry show in the UAE's history, where Informa, the Italian jewelry exhibitors, uh, are, are participating in this, uh, in this show. Um, and we have our Dubai Diamond Conference, which if you look at all the sponsors and all the, co all the contributions and the involvement from, uh, from others, I think that's more or less history. You will see here and there a comment, but nothing really attacking uh, Dubai's credibility more of maybe capturing this market or that market, but we're growing fast. Last year, we, we had 68 tenders, and I expect more, more this year. Um, I expect also more emerald tenders happening at the diamond exchange. We're also having plans to expand our trading floor. Um, we will be at the end of this year, possibly DMCC's co management moving to the Uptown Tower, where the vacant floors will be used to support the Dubai Diamond Exchange. I want to ask you about Uptown a bit later, if you don't mind. Um, but so, OK, the, uh, uh, the controversy over diamonds seems to have died down. For the past five, six years, yes. OK, good, good. Well, that's good, isn't it? But, uh, 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 but you've gone from strength to strength in diamonds, haven't you? Um, and uh, I call DMCC... Well, one development on that is that Surat, uh, two, three years ago, um, started flying internationally, and their first flight was to the UAE. And you could see the difference in our trading floors. So, Surat is becoming. Surat in India. Yes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Uh, I call DMCC uh, among the most successful uh, free zones in the UAE, and certainly the figures: uh, twenty thousand companies, a workforce of more than sixty-five thousand. 
Uh, you are certainly one of the biggest. This has been recognized by you know, various international awards, I know. So tell me, in a, in a nutshell, what's the secret of this success at DMCC? There's, there are a number of things. I believe, I believe it's, we, we deal with our members not as just registering and just selling or leasing them property. We have workshops, we have discussions, we have the webinars. There's the DMCC knowledge series. We've even grown in the crypto side of the business. I believe, I believe we've, we've become good at providing the proper ecosystem, not because we actually know beforehand what you need, but we actually talk and communicate with the market and we adjust and pivot as and when is needed. Um, case in point, the tea center with its business community and the coffee center as well, which is now thriving also, even though it's based in Jabal Ali free zone. That's a, two of our operations are based there simply because it's a custom bundled free zone. I get it. Um, I would say, I would say also, we capitalize a lot on Dubai's strength as a logistic hub, the infrastructure. Um, it's, I think, I think we jump on opportunities in a timely manner. We don't jump on them after it's passed. So, so there, there might be uh, businesses that might seem too far fetched. I mean, the Uptown Tower did, did not look exciting for a lot of people at the time when we talked about it, when we started building it. But now, as, as it's being completed, there are a lot of international business looking to move into the UAE and had that tower not be available, we'd have missed the opportunity. That leads me right into my next question because uh, international uh, rivals uh, like Hong Kong and Singapore uh, have probably not negotiated the pandemic crisis as well as Dubai, the UAE. So have, have you been targeting them and others like them as new sources of business for DMCC? I, would, I wouldn't put it that way. I mean, uh, Informa, Informa, I met them in Hong Kong a few years before the pandemic, and they, they still find Hong Kong as an important base, but they wanted to expand their business beyond Hong Kong already, and they were talking to us to have a, to have a specific time slot within the schedule, and things got difficult for them, but this was already in play. Um, it's, uh, I wouldn't say I'm targeting Hong Kong, though. It's... Uh, it's more cooperation or com com complementing each other, if you will. Let me ask you about Saudi Arabia, uh, because we are, of course, a Saudi media organization. Uh, and Saudi Arabia is the biggest economy in the region. Uh, the Saudi government has been pushing ahead with very uh, expansionist plans for Riyadh, uh, uh, to make Riyadh a, a big commercial financial center in the Middle East. Um, how do you view competition with Saudi and is, is there enough of the cake to go, you know, will the cake grow fast enough to give everyone a larger slice? Well, you know, we had a similar uh, discussions on diamonds and the assumption was we would take business away, but we started growing the market. We, we grew the cake because it, it tapped into uh, new markets for the diamond industry. When I look at Saudi, um, I also look at it as a coffee producer. They have farms, they have, which is bordering with Yemen. Uh, but for me, I look at it from different levels. There's, they have, they're big in jewelry as well. Um, when Saudi also wants to promote itself, it's not just Davos, New York. You could see Neom had uh, billboards in Dubai. There's a bit of complementing as well. Um, I've, I see it as an opportunity. I Personally, I love the fact that there are competing centers because it just breeds quality and we're up for the challenge. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's, it's a fun challenge for me. Um, Israeli and Jewish uh, business people are involved globally in the gold and diamond trade big time, aren't they? How important is this trade flow for you? And what effect has the recent normalization of relations between the UAE and Israel had for your business in DMCC? For me personally, it's a relief to see this. Um, it's a... Uh... It's very convenient for them. It's very convenient. I mean, uh, sometimes when, th when the lockdown gets too strong in Israel, you see them extending their stay in Dubai for a few months as well. Across the board, man, crypto business, tech business, you know, there's uh, Israel Valley, if you will. Um, there's a lot to learn. I'm excited about more than just the business and what to learn from them. Um, and at my house, I have, I have Turkish, uh, Turkish type coffee bags from Israel from a family business from 1929. That's been there since 1929. There's a lot to learn, even though I've engaged with them since 
the Dubai Diamond Exchange has been a member of the World Federation of Bors Diamond Bourses, um, there's so much more to learn. There's so much. I think I think the biggest impact is the innovation and the technology that we uh, we attract from there. Um, you know, the, the there are key businesses that I've known that are international that 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 you know, like Zim Shipping, with this operation with DP World. Um, I wish I knew how, how, how the impact would be. All I know is it's not going to be negative. It won't be the same. Um, Has there already been a big uh, upturn? In, well, in there's more than business? that. There's, there's a student from the UAE that's looking to get educated in Israel. You're going to see, you're going to see more of that happening. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know how to put this. Uh, it's just happening a lot. Like as we're speaking right now, and yesterday the president of Israel was in, uh, at the expo. The Dubai and DP World and DMCC and these these businesses here, they didn't really have open access to it before. So uh, it it might likely be it's uh, how do I say it's uh, it's 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 most convenient partner. I mean uh, it's it's just a, it's just a it's just a piece of the puzzle that uh, that that makes me excited. Um, there. The challenges that Israel faced in the past uh, two, three decades made it strong. I mean, I do, I do recall a quote from His Highness during the Davos meeting in, uh, in Jordan, I believe 2004 or five, and he said the boycott made Israel strong. We boycotted them, and what happened, they became the, the leading industry in uh, shipping, security, and technology, because you've minimized the choices for them. So it's, uh, but that's at that time. Today, today we're, we're in a different uh, world and a new era that I really welcome, personally. Uh, it's not all about things that glitter, like uh, gold and diamonds, is it? Because uh, you're also big in tea, coffee, and other uh, soft agricultural products. Tell me about them, and are you planning to expand the range uh, of these kind of products? There are a lot of good ideas. Um, the challenge is to <clears throat> make sure that you've taken care of what you have and expanding it as, as it requires. And also resources. It's not easy. It's not easy to just get the right people with the right attitude to work in these, in these businesses. For example, the tea center uh, contributes 15 to 20 percent of Dubai's re-exports, which is above 60 percent for the past, my god, um, I would say 13 years or 12 years now. Um, we're looking to add new services as uh, we're looking to provide herbal teas and do, do services for the medicinal teas at some stage. We're looking to triple the size of the tea center for storage because it's, it's fully, it's, uh, fully uh, the capacity has been tapped out so much that they've taken a piece of the coffee center storage facility. Um, the coffee center, the coffee initiative was a project that we've seen uh, too far-fetched 10, 15 years ago, um, and there are differences between the two, but that has changed. We've, we've, we've lucked out by signing up with Brambati that has an automated system. Uh, Fabrizio Brambati visits us every other month, actually. So we've, we've uh, you're talking about a facility that stores 15 uh, million square feet of temperature co te control storage for green coffees. 50% of the green coffees gets processed and reshipped. 50% does get roasted and shipped to its destination. Some also goes inland. Um, we're looking to expand that facility to possibly add cold brew bottling facility, um, maybe the capsules. We're looking at our options. We have a five kilo roaster, 30 kilo roaster, 60 kilo roaster. At some stage, if, that, if, if there's a lot of pressure, we might add a 380 kilo roaster, but all of it needs to be timed correctly. Now, you, you asked me what other commodities. Um, some, some of them are so straightforward, I take a step back and take a more challenging project, and, I, and that's what happened with coffee. 2015, I believe PricewaterhouseCooper was recommending as their number one option would be meat, kosher meat, halal meat, and all that. And I still went for coffee. Um, I expected that there would be a stronger coffee culture by the time we've, uh, uh, we've, we've been established. I've really underestimated that uh, prediction. I mean, just a few weeks ago, we've hosted, uh, Dubai has hosted the World Coffee Championship with the Sheikh Mohammed attending it as well. And, and, and that's, that's the biggest event in the coffee industry. Other commodities that I'm looking at would be saffron, 
Saffron? Honey, yes, saffron, okay. honey uh, at some stage. Uh, but I, I, I want to be careful with these things. So some regions that claim to produce honey from theirs is not really from the origin. And there is technology that can identify that. I'm looking into that cautiously. There's also um, uh, cooking oil bottling facility that I'm looking at as well, which, which is similar to why the coffee and tea center uh, works. Some regions have too strong union laws, and when you have too strong union laws, they don't allow automated systems that might minimize the amount of uh, jobs, but that these things happen. You got Bill Gates talking about it. Bill Gates is quoted as saying, we should tax the machines because they're taking away jobs. I don't know how that works, but you Google it, it's, it's there. Um, Dubai doesn't have that problem. We don't mind having automated machines. Even cutting at some stage will be automated. Still done by handiwork and all that, but at some stage that's going to happen. Um, other exciting commodities I know will be nuts, ca pistachio, cashew nuts, almond nuts, um, chili, black pepper. I I think I'm tapped out. I do not. I do not want to mention anything else. But halal meat, kosher meat. Th this this is likely going to happen soon. Even if somebody else comes up with their own project in uh, in the UAE, expect us to provide something at some point. You you mentioned uh, Saudi coffee earlier. Would you uh, 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 process and market Saudi, Saudi coffee here in the UAE? Yeah. Of course, we process Yemeni coffee. Why wouldn't we right. process okay. Saudi coffee? Okay. Mr. Bin Salim, the, uh, the world is going crypto crazy, isn't it? With new uh, uh, currencies and currency trading hubs and exchanges springing up everywhere. Some people are skeptical uh, about the uh, claims of Bitcoin and others that they're the currencies of the future. Where do you stand on this debate? I, I think that you're rather positive, aren't you? Um, you know, we, uh, I'll give an example. We were, a few years ago, we were the, one of the first to open our doors to lab-grown diamonds. The industry, as long as they, as long as they disclose that it's lab grown, we don't mind. And some of them, in their selling pitch, they make sure that the the their buyers know it's not from the mines. So that's a different market. Um, for the crypto world and our partnership with CV Labs, um, it's really adding another venue, another dimension for this industry. Um, I know, I know that uh, before CV Labs, we've opened the licensing for pro property trading. We worry about any business handling other people's money if the regulatory framework's not there. And we don't mind moving as fast as the weakest link. And I, when, I, when I say that, it's like the speed limits on the roads. It's not, maybe it's not, it's not there for all the best drivers, but it is there for the whole community. So as and when the central bank is ready and the regulator is ready to allow, we expand. Um, CV Labs and the DMCC Crypto Center prefer to be more, reg uh, on, uh, more regulated. But coming back to the propriety trading license, it gets used differently by some members, not just to buy and sell and cash, but also for, for, for regions whose currencies are weak, they don't need to deal with their own currency. They get paid in crypto and then they convert it to the currency they prefer or, or something else. So that opened, that's a solution or lifesaver, if you will. Um, there are, there are other businesses, crypto graphics, crypto music, uh, and, and you have, for example, one of our members, Ivai, that does uh, rating. It's a rating agency for crypto and blockchain businesses. 100% AI and machine learning, and they don't get paid for it. So no chance of corruption or conflict of interest. No human, and they don't have an incentive to give you a higher rating or keep it. So, and, and they see a business opportunity in that. But you're waiting on central bank uh, final approval, are you? I'm good. I'm good at where we are. I know, I know uh, the headlines are the centers here and that. I'm fine with it. It's going to grow. I mean, Binance have set up here in, uh, by the trade center freeze, and I could not be any happier for that. And knowing CZ, um, he's not going to put all his eggs in one basket. He has to spread it around to keep Binance alive uh, or, you know, out of any risk. Uh, let me ask you about real estate because uh, uh, Jumeirah Lakes Towers, which is the uh, uh, physical venue for the DMCC, is also a very big real estate business, isn't it? Uh, give me your perspective on how the real estate market has gone over the past few years. It was very flat for a long time. Are we, are we out of that? Are we emerging from the other end? In a general uh, way, I'm hearing that this, uh, property prices are going up, demand's going up. 
Um, for JRT, uh, I think it was six years ago or so, we've uh, delivered the uh, one JLT or maybe five years ago. And for the past four or five years, we've rented out G plus 14 Leeds Gold Office. Each floor is about 21, 22,000 square feet. Columnless, because the columns go up with the building. I bring that up because um, buildings like the one JLT and, and also the Uptown Tower, Leeds Gold as well, um, A standard buildings like that are in high demand. You don't have enough. It's either a challenge with the car park or something. You do have that. So, But with one JLT, it's been fully occupied for the past few years, even though they were challenging years. Um, so it depends where, it depends what the initiatives are. So, you know, I, uh, property, property is different. It's, uh, it's, it's different for each, each location and what that location is providing. So you have the MCC, the advantage of being in that community. You have next to the Atlantis Hotel, the, Ro the Royal Atlantis a residential building. That is such a beautiful initiative. It, uh, it looks to me, it's, 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 it's tailor-made for celebrities and the one percenters. It's just a ridiculous type of project. I, when I saw it in its model, I thought they, will they would never replicate that in reality. And what I see in reality is more impressive than the, mo the, the planning stage, which should be opening in the next month or two. Tell me about Uptown Tower. Was progress there affected by the pandemic? What's, what's, what's the latest update? When, when do you see that opening? Based on the announcement, it's uh, by the end of the year. Um, end of this year? End of okay. this year. I'm hoping to move, move in. We've been, we've been lucky with the contractor. I mean, I've had a good experience with Taisei, uh, Taisei ACC that built uh, Almas Tower. We've had a good relationship with Bimbelele Beytour. Taisei is a Japanese contractor. Uh, Beytour is a Turkish contractor. Did a nice job in uh, the Gold and Silver Tower but nothing uh, like the profession, profession we've had with Bessex, the Belgian contractor. They've, uh, they've really excelled. The last few floors, they would be delivering it every four days or so. My team are not concerned about the offices. It's for rental. The, uh, and then there's about 11 floors, boutique hotel with, with Accor's So Brand. We're calling it So Uptown. And the rest is branded Resi. We're very comfortable with it. Um, had we looked, had we felt the opportunities now and we're starting to construct it, then there's a risk because the opportunities passed. They would have moved mm -hmm. to other centers, other areas. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you got to take a risk and hope for the best. Um, and the main strategy behind Uptown Tower is bigger than just the building itself, is to attract more investments and strategic partners to develop the whole area. Okay, so that's a southern expansion of the whole JLT DMCC zone, is it? And and uh, it's uh, within it. The, yeah. We've had that land before. Okay, okay. We've had it before. It's zoned and everything. It's a development uh, rather than expansion. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Did I hear you correctly there that you're moving DMCC operations out of Almas Tower and into Uptown? Just the DMCC headquarter. The free zone will continue its services in the Almas Tower. The Dubai Diamond Exchange will still be there. Obviously, the, 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 the vault will be there. Um, nothing changes except for our headquarters will be based off Uptown Tower. Okay. Finally. The crypto center are looking at uh, the Uptown Tower. They're running out of space okay. in our mass tower. So okay. they might be expanding into it or completely shifting there. Right. Crypto. Yeah. Finally, Mr. Bin Sulaim, uh, uh, just give me an overview, if you would, of of how you've handled the pandemic uh, uh, crisis and how uh, Dubai and the UAE has handled it. Are we uh, emerging weaker or better positioned? My experience with the COVID is me having it beginning of uh, 2021 in, in January. But I'm not a scientist. I don't know this. Uh, I don't know this virus pretty well. But the way we took it is we had faith in our government. We had faith and we encouraged our members that things will get better. We will open up in time. That period, even though people are forgetting, that period is important. We, we, we made sure that we were accessible. We had a lot of webinars just, just so these, because we understand our members, uh, the companies are either in lockdown somewhere else, they can't travel, and I did not want their imaginations to go too far. So there was a bit of comfort. The other thing that uh, made a huge difference is that we've 
we've, we have your, your setup, your licensing and services can be done 100% online. And, and, uh, and that needed to be revamped uh, and made sure that it's up to standard. I personally worry about companies doing everything online. I'm trying to remember the company's name, uh, Leap or Take a Leap, Leap, it'll come back to me. It's a property company, kind of like Uber or something where you could visit buildings but virtually rather than traveling and all that and make a decision. And they set up completely online. And I, and I said, when I worry about it being a hacker, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, no, it was secure. I'm like, how come? Well, the security checks that they've done, you know, it's more than just show us today's newspaper, pull your left ear or show us your ID, is just as good as us coming in person and registering. And that's their words. Uh, and I really saw it as an opportunity. Personally, you asked me how I handled it. I saw it as an opportunity because I kind of have a view of what the other businesses and specialized zones and maybe other centers outside they would be shell-shocked. They would be like, take a pause. And I, I'm, I was in touch with my team, the same with Faryal and the rest. They engage with everyone with internally to make sure that you know, they, they're not left alone, they're, not, uh, they're, they're encouraged. And you know, I didn't know how long this lockdown would take. I mean, I didn't believe it would be four weeks, let alone as, far, as long as it did. But thankfully, the DMCC team stuck together and today you see, you see us uh, reaping the benefits of that. Ahmed bin Sulayam, Executive Chairman of the Dubai Multi-Commodity Center. Thank you very much indeed. Fascinating conversation. Uh, I'm very grateful to you for appearing on Frankly Speaking. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Pleasure.